Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Welcome, Bill Schley, to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm honored. To give a bit of backstory, I read an incredible book over my Christmas vacation whilst in America. I was in Florida at my cousin's house and I read the microscript rules. And I think it pretty much changed the way that I look at copywriting, at look at storytelling. In fact, it's just changed the way I, I lead my business. Oh, thank you. I, I usually when there's a compliment like that, I'm I'm already like needing smelling salts to 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 revive myself. That was so so kind. Do you want me? Well, I, I that's that's the hope from anyone who writes a book like this. You want to tell me, but how quickly? How you think it might have? Well, I think it just distills your messaging into six words or less. I think it really helps you to refine what it is you're saying and understanding that it's all about what the client repeats, not what they're here. Yeah, yeah. Well, they like to, the brain loves to remember and repeat these, these little ideas and these little sentences and the brain, these things we call microscripts and they, and, and the brain, it's interesting to remember an unlimited number of these things. So you know, what it did for me was, you know, I'm a branding, I've been a, a branding person and an advertising writer for most of my career. And, and, and you realize that you're always looking for the heart of the matter. You know, you, you're looking to find where the center, the center of everything. What is the most important idea inside of everything? And it's, a, it's always the simplest idea too. You know, the simple message always wins. And so one of the things about the, the microscripts and, and realizing that you got to distill, have the discipline to distill an idea down to six or seven or eight words is that it really helps you find that center because you're always looking for the center. And, and until it's that simple, you really haven't found the center. But the center is the, is, the, is the genesis of everything. Once you find the center, it's literally like a nucleus and a, it just your ideas explode from that center and it's, and it's unforgettable. And that's what you're looking to do with your brand or any marketing message. But the, what we learned earlier on, you could, it's easy to say, okay, you know, you've got to keep it simple. And everybody says that, but how do you keep it simple? You know, it's, it's not easy to keep it simple, but it's worth it when you do, when you find that center. So this was sort of a mechanism for that. And it also ex helped me explain as I went, and I started to study the neuroscience of this because you realize this is how the brain works. You know, when, when, uh, when you're forced with instant mortal danger, you know, like I said, I'm swimming, you're a scuba diver and there's a big great white shark staring you in the face. Things get really, really simple. You know, it is not complicated. And you start to realize that um, the way the brain works is it's the opposite of what we're taught in school because we're taught to, get, you know, and I've seen, you know, big corporations, they have an idea and they go out and test it in a million cities. And do, but they get so much information that they get complete analysis paralysis. They actually, you find out that too much data can make you dumber. You, the simple message always is clear and always wins. And so it all, this theory all folds back on itself. And then you look at what people remember all throughout history, and you find out that history is driven by six or seven words. I mean, you ask someone to read a book about Winston Churchill or Abraham Lincoln, and they'll give them a, you know, a 50,000 word book and ask them enough afterwards, they'll say he freed the slaves. That's how our brains work. And it happens because we had to package we, we uh, our, our brains only have so much horsepower so that when and when we're in danger or in, in, in you know very difficult situations we have these little rules of thumb called heuristics that um, our brain switches to and it just remember a rule the brain doesn't have to think it just does the rule and it's done when you know if our pilots use them uh, sailors use them your mother taught you with these little heuristic rules of thumb she gave you she said right from the beginning she said where there's smoke there's fire she said, stop, drop, and roll. She said, stranger danger. She said, in the, in the New York subways, they go, if you see something, say something. It just goes on and on and on. She'll tell you, she'll teach you about life. You know, 
Um, the, 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 the early bird gets the word. Honesty is the best policy. But what, what your mom was doing was giving you these little microscripts that she knew your brain could remember. And I promise you, you, you never, ever forget them because we're wired that way from the from, from earliest, earliest times. So then you start to realize, oh, wow, if I've got something to communicate that I want people to remember, wouldn't it make sense to write it in little microscripts? Or would it make sense to say, you know, uh, some of the famous ones, and then I will, I'll test this. I'll be giving a talk and I will, like I was in India once, this is before the internet. And I, I don't know, most people remember the OJ Simpson trial, right? Okay. The OJ Simpson trial was um, the most famous thing. The one thing, Marsha Darden, the prosecutor had 9 million bits of information she wanted to re you remember over nine months. And Johnny Cochran knew about microscripts. So he said, I can save you the trouble if you don't want to know what to do tomorrow, you know, jury when you vote to convict or, or uh, acquit he just said if the glove doesn't fit you must acquit he said he said oj was framed by the cops framed by the racist la cops um it's all about that bloody glove if it if the glove doesn't fit you must acquit now 20 years later i was in india um again before the internet i was doing a speech and i said here finish i'll give you a phrase you finish the other half of it so i said if the glove doesn't fit the whole audience went you must acquit <laughs> now now they hadn't they hadn't even heard that phrase they were from india and yet it traveled all around the world it's at the power of these things or if i said melt in your mouth they go not in your hand or m m's or if i said um i don't know what happens in vegas stays in vegas <laughs> Yeah, how about size doesn't matter? <laughs> exactly. And the thing is, these things are instantly, your brain can remember an unlimited number of ideas when they're packaged in these little scripts because it's brain speak. This is what the brain does anyway. So when you give people these little microscripts, they love you for it. And they will, and they will, and they will basically you give you can give them a little elevator pitch and description in two lines and they will gladly repeat that to everyone they know if they like your product and that's part of that's what the great branders did back in starting in mad men days they created these taglines and every great tagline is written in microscript if you if you look at them they are you know um so i mean i'm you know, you're getting you're just looking at me so you're making i'm gonna keep talking and talking no it's great i mean I, it's just it makes sense i mean you're talking from a branding perspective a marketing perspective uh, uh, or actually more than that a life you know talk about life lessons I'm talking about life i'm talking about learning i'm talking about succeeding i'm talking about the navy seals these are the guy, american guys that are in the in the worst toughest um in real you know life or death situation bullets are flying I met I met members of even the Israeli uh, Mossad when we were writing our book about um, this stuff, and they would and they'd say, you know, they when they're in battle, when things are now, they remember they have a little they call it a little toolkit, and the toolkit it's a little kit of my, these little scripts, and what to do when when this, when stuff's going wrong. It's their little bag of bag of tools, and they, it's like for every lesson there's a there's a script. And pi, I'm a pilot. That's a, and I'm a skydiver. That's how you learn. That's how you learn. You remember. Every time I go or every time I sail into a harbor, it's red, right, returning that one. See what a lot of what these things can do when they when they're used to educate, what they do is they give you a master aligning principle, one master aligning principle, red, right, returning means when you're going into the harbor, the red buoys on the right. Now, what that does is aligns you on all the other buoys because they are all in relation and going out of the harbor. So one master aligning principle, you find out that you can learn anything anything with three or four master aligning principles mostly i can teach you to fly a plane with with three of these but they're all in, they're written in microscript so it just keeps coming back it, it just keeps coming back and folding in on this this truth about how these things are done so simple simple always wins and less is more yeah what how do how does this get used in uh, education in politics in other areas in politics let me give you an example. I'm going to my book now, Amy, because, you know, when you write a book, you can't remember what's in it. Let me tell you what. Let me tell you what Hillary, Hillary Clinton, Clinton against Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton basically would say that she'd go and she'd say, oh, that was that I was I felt discombobulated in that situation. And she'd give you a whole technocratic answer about something. Here's what Trump did. Trump called her 
first of all, he named her like a schoolyard, Crooked Hillary. But then he, and he, and I, he named everybody else. But he, here's what he said. He said, make America great again. He said, we're going to build a wall and Mexico is going to pay for it. He said, fake news, which has gone around the world as being used by, uh, you know, dictators and autocrats everywhere. He said, the election is rigged unless I win. He said, drain the swamp, deep state, lock her up. Win so much, you'll be sick of winning. Bring back the stolen jobs. I'm a businessman and many, many more. And like we said, the people like Trump would give you, um, the Democrats give you a whole white paper, an intellectual argument, and the, and the Republicans learned to say, um, <laughs> here's what one Democrat had said it like this. He said the candidate, the, the candidates uh, accuse the other one of being misogynistic, xenophobic. This this issue strains credibility, and the Republicans came back with, they're going to pull the plug on grandma. Now, if you know what that was, what that was was they were talking about when they didn't want they didn't want to have health care. You know, they didn't want to have the Ob- Obamacare. So it's just that um, you can use these things for good or evil. The Democrats, but the but. See, the old Democrats, Winston Churchill, I mean, how did Winston, what do we remember about Winston Churchill? The whole world remembers, right? We'll fight on the beaches, we'll fight in the fields, we shall never surrender. You know, if Britain lasts for a thousand years, it'll be our finest hour. You know, on and on and on and on. Franklin Roosevelt talking about a day to live in infamy. Abraham Lincoln saying, a, a nation of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish. This is how history is written, and this is how you communicate. So if you're a politician, um, and I'll tell you, in, in uh, George Bush, the first time he ran, ran against um, uh, John Kerry, and, and they, they named him the flip-flopper because, they, it, because he went back and forth on his, um, uh, supposedly, on his positions. And um, if anything, George Bush was a much more of a flip flopper than than John Kerry was, but they called him a flip flopper, and that stuck. And they sputtered and they spluttered and they tried to say no, I'm not, and they tried to say it's not true, but they never came back with the counter microscript. And um, that thing probably won in the election. Uh, Ronald Reagan was famous, famous for saying, um, uh, "Are you better off than you were four years ago?" The entire population had that phrase spinning in their heads when they went in the voting booth and they said no, and they, they voted for Reagan. That's when everything changed in that debate, right? So these things are critical to anybody who's trying to communicate anything important, anything important. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a school teacher, it always comes down to one idea. What, okay, so what kind of an idea? And it's not just any kind of an idea. You'll find that a microscript is usually is a short. It's usually short, but use about a sentence or less. It can be two sentences sometimes. But what it does, it's used to inform or persuade, um, or or communicate, you know, or educate others. And it is usually a. It's it's formed. Usually, it's very visual. These are they're very visual images because people remember that. And what it does is it either tells you a whole story, okay. So here's a whole story. I saw there, uh, a, a, a bumper on a car once. It said, behind a running ball comes, yeah, behind a rolling ball comes a running child. Now that's a whole story, if you think about it. So it either tells you a whole, or, 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 or Splenda, the famous uh, sweetener, I don't know if you have that in, in, in the UK, but it's made from sugar, so it tastes like sugar. That's a whole story. It tells you everything you want to know about about the fact that it's made from this non-artificial thing so it doesn't taste artificial and you're saying it's the best artificial sweetener without an aftertaste. But most of the time what they do is they just trigger a story. What they do is you you know they what they do is they turn on a, a movie in your head. Okay? Instantly turns on a movie. Um, with these colorful metaphors. It uses metaphors very most of the time. So that's what they're made out of. So you say the bridge to nowhere. Never heard of the term the bridge to nowhere? That was that was again the the GOP in our country, the, uh, the Republicans, um, describing this project in Alaska that was supposedly a frivolous use of millions and millions of dollars of public funds, and their position was 
that the Democrats are ta- want to tax you to spend money on useless projects and they waste your money. And that's and and we're not going to tax you and we're not, not going to waste your money. They, they talked about this, the bridge to nowhere in Alaska. Um, it turned out the bridge to nowhere was anything but. The bridge to nowhere was the bridge to the Ketchikan airport that was built across the harbor because they built their new airport on an island that was about, you know, a few hundred yards offshore. It wasn't a bridge to nowhere. It was a bridge to the new airport. But when you label it the bridge to nowhere, all of a sudden, and you think about, it, look at what that turns on, the idea of the bridge to nowhere. I mean, you could write a whole, right? You could almost write a novel about that. So how did you get into this world of microscripts and copywriting? Okay, well, you asked about why. The, for, for me, it was, well, it started out, I mean, I, I as a kid, I liked TV commercials and I always thought, I, oh, I'd write funny commercials someday. And I, when I graduated from college, I had no intention or I, I I just didn't think I would possibly be able to work in an office like, you know, the one in the one in Slough where what, 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 what's his, what's his uh, yeah, the office. <laughs> yeah, the office with uh, what's his name? Melanie Griffith. What's his what's 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 his name? The comedian. Um, the comedian. Um, uh, uh, Gervais. Ricky Gervais. Ricky Gervais. Yes, thank you. Oh, God, I love him to death. Yeah, I could not imagine a cubicle ever in myself sitting in one. So I um, um, but I could imagine myself doing the TV commercials. So I, I, I did a, what they call a spec book and I actually got hired down in New York and, um, I started working for, for in those days they pay, I, I started working for 9,000 us dollars a year. <laughs> that was my salary. But, um, and, uh, but it was a Ted, it was a Ted Bates agency that had started by Rosser Reeves, who was the guy that invented this idea of the unique selling proposition. And he wrote all the great taglines like melts in your mouth, not in your hand. And he wrote a book called Reality and Advertising, which believe it or not, uh, by Rosser Reeves, the greatest book on the subject ever written. And my friend and colleague and client, Graham Weston, who was the chairman and chief shareholder in Rackspace, which a lot of people in the UK will know, which is a big, they were the big managed hosting company. Oh yeah, well, Graham and I got, actually went back and got Ross or Reeves' book, um, sorry, republished because it had been out of print for about 50 years and it's the greatest book ever. They used to give, us, give, give it out to us, co- the copywriters at Ted Bates. So it taught you about the, the unique selling proposition and people remember one thing and find that one thing and then hammer it over and over again. But it it taught you to get to the center of the problem, you know, by asking very, very simple questions, which is also how you get to microscripts, by the way. I mean, I can't tell the whole book right now, but you ask these simple questions. The questions actually become more important than the answers because the questions get you to the answers, you know, when you're looking to find the microscripts. But you say, why? I was trying to succeed. I think a lot of, I think if you have a why in your life, a big why, I think it's because you want something. Um, I mean, and why I do something, it's because I have something that I want that I don't have. I mean, I mean, it's, I, I, I want, you know, we talk about the eight human wants. Everybody wants to be safer. Everybody wants to be, well, they want to, they, they want to have more money. They do more, more than they want to have less. They want to be, they want to be healthier. They want to be stronger. They want to be smarter. They want to be more attractive, to the opposite sex. I mean, everybody wants, we call those the eight human wants. And I don't care what woke school of branding is discovered that that what we what i say is that technology changes every day but the truth never does humanity never does it's never going to change for all you people that are freaked out at what's going on with the new branding so my why was i wanted to figure out how to do this because i wanted to be good at it and i wanted to succeed but i really wanted to figure out how do these guys make these incredible breakthrough kinds of advertising messages and so i i read about it i studied it and i started to and and over the years you know i was seeking something the truth and i think over the years the more you seek eventually you're going to find you get closer and closer um, something like that. I think that I think that only about ten percent of us are seeker, real seekers. Amy, obviously you're one. I'm one, and I bet everybody. This is the, you know, one of those nice self-serving, but I think I, I bet everybody listening to your show is one. And it's a, they're very special kinds of people. They want to fix. They, they want something. It can be they want to fix something. They want to make something better. They want to make their life better. They want to figure something out. They very often they want to build something, 
but they don't want to just sit still. They don't want to just accept what the world gives, throws at them or offers them or hands to them or the rules the world says, here, here are your rules. And uh, they want to have, they, they want, they want some, there's a freedom and an independence that they're seeking, but they're seeking something better. And, and that lights the fire. And sometimes it can be for all kinds of reasons. Believe it or not, because I wrote a whole book on entrepreneurs, they all have this. Um, some want to just build something. Some want to just do it because they think they, they, they think that I, I, I'm become going to start a business because no one will ever give me a job. <laughs> my, my father, even Graham Weston will say that he, I don't, I didn't think anyone will hire me. Well, Graham became a billionaire and then hired 6,000 people, but it's, it's those, you can be, your why can be all kinds of different things. It can be, you're proving, you're proving to your, you know, abusive or your, you know, your, your, your dad, or you're the person that told you, you'd never amount to anything. You're going to prove them wrong. It can be any reason. doesn't matter but it's a, it's a very positive thing because it gets you in motion to find out, to find that thing. And the other thing about getting in motion is most of the time, once you get on the road to find something, very often you find out it's actually something else you're really looking for <laughs> and you find that and that's really the answer. And, and, but the only way you can find that is to get in motion, which is one of our laws of entrepreneurship. You got to get in motion. So, for me, the why was I wanted to be a good, I was a young guy and I really, really wanted to be good at this. And I, I wanted to understand and no one taught me. And, 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 and I, and I said, I would, here's the book I wish I had. And then the more you do it, then the more you learn about it and then you get better at it. So that was, I guess that was my why. Let me, can I say something about why though? There's, there are people, there are, there are marketing, you know, I don't know, gurus out there, I'm not going to name them, but um, they will tell you that, oh, it's so, people care so much about why. And what they mean about why is why you're building the product, um, why you're doing it, because you love food or you want to do something that, I don't know, you, 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 you love customer service and you want to create better customer service. I don't believe that. I think if you're a leader, you can motivate your people by giving them that why. I think, but I think customers first care about what. It doesn't matter how much you love food. If I go to your restaurant and the food is served late and it's cold and it's bland in taste, nobody cares about why. And by the way, no one wants to have a relationship with you either. What they want to do is there's so much going on. People lives are so strained and stressed and so busy. They've got 500,000 messages going by a minute. And what they first need is they have a need. And so as what is it, what is this that you do? You know, I have to know, I have to know it's a restaurant or a kindergarten or a, or a museum. I got to know what it is. Then I need to know why do I need it? In other words, what's it going to do for me? And finally, I, I finally, there's three questions. Why do I buy it from you? So that's a little microscript. We call it the three W's. That every single marketing message there is must answer. If they walk away, they need to know those three questions or they cannot and will not buy from you. What is it? Why do I need it? And why should I buy it from you? And that's the way the brain thinks about that. So when you hear people tell you, um, oh, it's just, all, you know, people care so much about the fact that you care so much about people. No, they don't. The first thing they need is I, I, I have a headache. I want it to go away. I don't care that you love good health and you want to help people. I have a headache. I want it to go away. And I don't care what your, what your persona is. I don't care what your spirit animal is. I don't care what your archetype or your, or your, what do you call it? Sign is. Star sign. Every, yeah, everybody has a problem and they want it to go away. So that what I, what I have is a headache, Red. Why you need it is going to make your headache go away in 10 minutes and why should I buy it from you? And then you can, you can tell me it's either the fastest or more effective or it's the only one with X ingredient. So that's the reality. And that those realities will never, never, ever change in marketing. Never. So um, 
Uh, and one of my issues is where can I, am I allowed to plug what some, some of what I'm doing? We're starting a brand Titans masterclass online. Now the brand Titans masterclass, it's called the school of brand secrets. You can't learn in school. And what it is, it's, it's all these forgotten secrets of the mad men and the guys that taught me all the forgotten secrets that went into the microscript rules and my earlier books, but it's a whole course in that. And I promise you, you're not going to be able to learn it anywhere because they don't teach this anymore. They, they got, you see commercials on TV where you where you watch it for thirty seconds. You don't you don't even know what the product is. That's not what we 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 didn't learn. We we learned that the, you have to make the product the most interesting thing in the commercial. That's hard. That's what that's what your real job is as a brander. So you're really passionate about what you're doing. Was there a particular time where you tipped over into this, or or did you just know from the start that you just wanted to work on this and hone it? You mean, well, this particular aspect, well, this, no, no, this, this particular aspect, the microscript was, we, it was the last piece of the puzzle for me. In other words, you can have a, the, the, you can have the strategy, which is um, what we call the dominant selling idea. You can have one big idea that you stand for because people only remember one thing. So find that one thing and, and stand for it. Um, and, and, and be number one in that thing in people's minds. So the dominant selling idea is it has an idea. It's, it's a five part idea. It has to be superlative. So you have to say, I'm the best at what I, I'm the best at this, whether it's in my neighborhood, whether it's in my community, whether it's in the industry, but I'm the best at this. Okay. Then you have to give them, um, it has to be something they want. So it has to be important. So it's superlative, important, it has to be believable coming from you. It has to be, it's all in the, it's all in the book though too, but uh, it has to be measurable. I I I, I want to see it working. Let me see it working. Right? And when you get in the car and they say it smells inside like rich Corinthian leather, as you can feel, you can see it working. Um, and uh, and then it has to be ownable by you. If somebody else already owns this idea, I'm sorry, but you move your idea a little bit to the left or the right, and you own, you create a new category, and you own that category. And it's done every day in branding. So that's the strategy. That what's the big idea? We're going to build the world's safest cars. You know, we, we're going to put a computer inside a, a, a cell phone, you know, a big, one, big idea like that. Radio used to be one, just two way, one way broadcast. We're going to create the first two way radio. Simple binary ideas. Um, uh, and then, but that's, but that's a strategy, but it's not necessarily the way I remember things. Well, I remember things with microscripts. So the last piece of the puzzle is people don't remember strategy. They remember these beautiful little scripts that were, that are unforgettable. So they learn, you can say, you know, Las Vegas is the, uh, the adult play, the, the world's number one adult, you know, playground, you know, famous around the world. You can say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Or you can say M&Ms are these little, little chocolate candies that fit in your palm with little co different colors in a candy shell that don't melt. You can say it melts in your mouth, not in your hand. You create these little, little scripts. That's the final piece of the puzzle that, that lock it in that make it unforgettable. So once we found it, the microscripts, then I realized that's, that's what they're doing. So the dominant selling idea is your idea. Now, now say it in microscripts. And now you've got something, because again, it doesn't matter if, if you say it, if people can't remember and repeat it. And microscripts make you remember and repeat it. And there's one more thing. In the world of uh, you know, cell phones and social media, people don't realize that it's just all the media is a new set of pipes to send a message through. So what kind of set message is to send through those pipes? All the cell phone is, is a, is a word of mouth machine. It's a, it's a, it's a 21st century word of mouth machine. Word of mouth is the oldest form of human. It was the caveman's favorite form of communication was word of mouth and word of mouth works because it puts trust right up front. And gets it out of the way because no one will listen to or believe or remember anything from anyone they don't trust. They just ignore it. Used to be you got trust by a long relationship of trial and error and you performed as plan or after a while people trusted you. But when you get um, when you get a message from someone you already trust, like a friend or a family member or a, or a trusted colleague, trust trust is, is you take care of trust right off. Now I'm listening to your message. They say, you've got to go to that restaurant. It's the greatest restaurant in the world, right? So word of mouth from a peer is the most important thing. So with these little word of mouth machines, instead of just over the backyard fence, I can, I can, I can send my little message to a million people. 
That's the power they have. But the message, but the message is still the message. That's still just the medium. What are you going to say to them? And and what if you want to be effective, outgo those microscripts to people. If you want to remember your product, tell me, tell me that uh, what was it? Oh God, what's the uh, airborne? Do they have that product in in, in England? Mm, I don't think so. Well, it's this vitamin C supplement thing that was, and, and people remember, it's the one that's, that the flight attendants use to get, when they go on a plane to keep themselves from getting sick. And it was invented by a second grade teacher because, of course, she'd walk in the classroom with a million sniveling kids, and she invented this concoction in her um, living room sink, or actually living room sink, her kitchen sink. But they, they said, you know, it's, it's the one invented by second grade teachers. See, that little idea is what stuck and made this thing a huge success. Then it turned out that, it wasn't true, but it still worked. <laughs> um, but that's the key. So the microscripts are the key. You come up with the microscripts. You tell me the domino theory. Here, let me give you some. Wait. Well, these great taglines, you know, Wheaties Breakfast of Champions. You know Wheaties, right? The cereal? We, yeah, I don't know if we have the same brand. It's probably re- changed the name, but. Chunky Soup. Do you have Chunky Soup? No, we don't. <laughs> the soup that eats like a meal. See, that's the thing. Well, how about Time S Watches? Timex takes a licking and keeps on ticking. That's a good one. Now, that was one that says they hate. Well, their the strategy was a dominant selling idea is we 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 build the world's toughest affordable watch for every man, for every for every person. But takes a it takes a licking and keeps on ticking. You can hear people say that all over the all over the country. The ultimate driving machine. BMW. Yeah. Is it true that blondes have more fun? That was a classic. <laughs> that was for that was for Claire all, I think, or one of the it saw oh, how about a diamond is forever? Absolutely. Yeah, you've got to go with that. De, De Beers. Tell me that doesn't turn a movie on in your head. It's such an elegant, beautiful, unforgettable little phrase. So again, you find the idea that you're gonna stand for first. We're going to, and, and that, and by the way, people talk about mission, per- purpose, vision in companies. It's all the same thing. Don't listen to consultants. If you're going to, if we, if, if Volvo was started because the guy, the, the, the mechanic that he uh, started Volvo in 1907, I think his, his sister-in-law was killed in a car accident and cars were deadly in those days. I mean, come on, on Downton Abbey, didn't Matthew get killed in a car? Yes, he I did. rest my case, right? They, they weren't safe. They were, they were deadly. Someone told me that if uh, there have been no safety features put in cars since since then, at the at the at the run rate of of you know the the death rate in cars would there would be seven hundred fifty thousand uh, highway deaths a year in the United States. That's how deadly they were. And so he he decided he was going to start a, a company that made the world's safest cars. And his mission was to make the world's safest car. His vision was to build the world's safest car. His purpose was to build safe cars so people didn't die. It's all the same thing. And and when you find, and so you find that idea and then you, and then to communicate it far and wide, if you, you know, the micro scripts uh, are immensely important to communicate, to get, to get that into the heads of other people. Because all a brand is, is an idea, not in your head, it's in their head, right? And then you, um, and then you stick with it. And what happens is that one idea, the microscript works on customers, but they work on your people too. They give the, your people the reason to come to work every day. We're building the world's safest cars. We're saving lives. And it guides all decision-making in the company. That's why brand is so important. It's not just a it's not just a hoodwink customers and sell them. It's 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 to it's to give people a center to say uh, put a flag on a mark ma- on a mountaintop and say you see this is where we're marching to every single day. You see that in the distance, and when they and the clearer they can see it, the more likely they can get there. That's what's so brilliant about these things. Well, I'd just like to say thank you for your masterclass in messaging and <laughs> microscripts. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. I know you've got another meeting now and you're helping other people with their messaging all the time. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. And I, again, I'm, I'm honored, Amy, that someone in, well, someone in UK read my little book and I get through to people. You know, when you write a book, when you're an author, um, you spend a lot of lonely hours and thinking, oh my God, this is this is 
this is rubbish. This is terrible. No one's ever going to want to read this or they're going to laugh at me. You know, you spend a lot of, there's a lot of, but you got to keep plotting on and believing it enough. And then you just hold your breath when the, when people read it. And, and if people actually like it and tell you that it helps them in their lives, well, that's what it's all, all for. Thank you for listening to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave me a five-star Apple podcast review. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook, and become a member of my inspiring, uplifting, and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. I help people to focus on their why with clarity, uniting their passion with their purpose with a plan to create the life they truly desire. If you would like me to help you focus on your why, then please book a free 20-minute coaching call via candidly.com forward slash Amy Rowlandson. And if you haven't already, please sign up for the Friday Focus weekly newsletter via my website, amyrowlandson.com. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.